Hello, my name is Peter Little. I'm an ancient historian based at the University of Manchester in the Department of Classics, Ancient History, Archaeology and Egyptology. In this lecture, I'm going to talk about one of the depth study papers in Ancient History A-Level. Uh, that is the culture and politics of Athens, about 460 to 399 BC. In particular, I'm going to be focusing on the relevance of three Athenian inscriptions to these specifications. And to do this necessitates a very short introduction to the use of inscriptions for the ancient historian. Collectively, inscriptions are known as epigraphical evidence and their study is known as epigraphy. The production of written inscriptions on stone and other hard surfaces is one of the most remarkable habits known to us from the ancient world. Ancient communities in the Greek and Roman world often wrote up transactions of their political, religious and administrative activities on stone and set them up in public places, often locations with religious significance. For example, on the right hand side of the screen, this fragment of the Athenian tribute lists now at the British Museum, originally set up on the Athenian Acropolis. Among the, same among the same communities, individuals set up or had set up on their behalf inscriptions in the form of gifts to the gods or funerary monuments. For instance, this inscribed monument set up as a dedication to the gods by a sponsor of athletic competitions in the fourth century BC, which survives today at the British Museum. Accordingly, inscriptions provide us first-hand evidence into a wide range of ancient public and private habits, often at a very high level of detail. Hundreds of thousands of ancient inscriptions in Greek and Latin survive from the Mediterranean world and its hinterland in antiquity, and some 20,000 survive from the ancient city of Athens alone. The inscriptions of ancient Athens have been studied in meticulous detail since they were recorded by the traveller Syriacus Fancona on his visit to Greece in the 15th century. Many have been brought to collections across Europe and North America. The inscriptions of ancient Athens have never been more accessible to everyone. The Attic Inscriptions Online website sets out to publish open access translations of these inscriptions. By early 2020, it contained translations and discussions of over 1,783 inscriptions. There is even a YouTube channel with videos about inscriptions and collections of inscriptions, mostly, mostly in UK collections. And in a supplementary paper available on the AIO website, the foundation, founder of AIO, Stephen Lambert, has published a short guide to locating inscriptions, essays, images, videos, and relevant teaching material that are hosted by the resource. He's also published a paper discussing the implications of two inscriptions which appear on the A-level syllabus, the Calchas Decree and the Thudipos Decree on Tribute Reassessment, which are suggested in the, same, in the source material for the relations between Greek states and non-Greek states period paper um, in the OCR specifications for A-level ancient history. They're very useful uh, resources, detailed resources, if you haven't looked at them already. I want to turn to the depth study paper, Politics and Culture of Athens, 460 to 399 BC. Appendix 5E of the OCR document suggests a number of literary sources relevant to the specifications. Um, there are also a number of archaeological sources described as archaeological evidence buildings on the Acropolis and the, the Athenian Agora built as part of the Periclean building program and Theodeon of Pericles and the temple at Sunion. At first glance, there are no inscriptions. We're almost entirely reliant on literary authors and the interpretation of material culture. But of course, the view that I take is that the relevance to, to, to the OCR specifications of inscriptions is profound and goes way beyond the source material that they propose. 
Athenian inscriptions, in particular inscriptions in UK collections, are relevant to certain key topics in the specifications for this depth study. And I've ringed the key topics uh, that I think are particularly, or that relevant, that, that inscriptions are particularly relevant. Athenian political and social culture, secondly, art and architecture and its significance in the culture of Athens, um, and thirdly, religion and its significance. So for the next few minutes, I'll be looking at three inscriptions in UK collections with a view to their relevance. It's obvious that these are not the only inscriptions that are relevant to the specifications. So much of our understanding of the chronology and the culture of the period is based on inscriptions. Um, but I hold them, so I hold these, in, these out only as examples. And I should acknowledge that these inscriptions have been studied by myself, by Polly Lowe, by Stephen Lambert and Robert Pitt as part of an AHRC sponsored project to publish all of the 220 Athenian inscriptions in UK collections. You'll find editions of these inscriptions and specific papers dedicated to them on the Attic Inscriptions Online website. As the specifications offer the date range 460 to 399, I've restricted myself to inscriptions of that era, though obviously there is a great deal of later material that's relevant to the key topics of the syllabus. But obviously we're going uh, from the reforms of Aphialtes down to the death of Socrates. Uh, our project is interested in inscriptions as a range of collections across the UK, including the Fitzwilliam in Cambridge, the Ashmolean in Oxford, National Trust properties in uh, Britain and Northern Ireland, uh, uh, the uh, uh, Scottish Museums, Leeds City Museum. But the three inscriptions I'm going to look at today are, the, um, uh, are at the British Museum. We don't know very much about the archaeological context of the three inscriptions I'm going to look at. They definitely derive from Athens, possibly from the Acropolis, but we know no more. Of their collection history, we know a bit more. They were the booty of collectors in the late 18th and early 19th centuries, brought to the UK because of their merit and apparent relevance to the history of the Golden Age of Athens. Two of them were part of the consignment brought back by Lord Elgin from Athens in the early 19th century and were purchased on behalf of the British Museum through an act of Parliament in 1816. So let's see what they say underneath the three key topics. So first of all, Athenian political and social culture. Um, the inscription that I've chosen under this heading is the so-called Decree of Kleinias that you're looking at now. One of the Elgin marbles. It's one of the four fragments of this piece, or four fragments of this inscription uh, that survive. The other three are in Greece. Um, it's a piece of white marble currently on display in Gallery 78 of the British Museum, a room that unfortunately is only open by appointment. Um, it's been published by our project as Attic Inscriptions in UK Collections 4.2, uh, so volume four, part two, number five. In terms of content, it's one of the measures that was undertaken by the Athenians in the middle of the Arcadian War to, tr to tighten up the payment of tribute by Athens' allies. This is what it says. The council and people decided, Kleinias proposed, the council and officials in the cities and the overseers shall manage that tribute is collected each year and conveyed to Athens. Tokens shall be made for the cities so that it shall not be possible for those conveying the tribute to do wrong. Let the city write on a writing tablet the tribute which it is sending and seal it with the token and send it to Athens. Those conveying it shall hand over the writing tablet to the council to be read when they hand over the tribute. Hold an assembly after the Dionysia for the Greek treasurers, that's the Hellenitanii, to reveal to the Athenians those of the cities which have paid the tribute in full and separately those which have fallen short. The Athenians shall elect four men and send them to the cities to give receipts for the tribute which has been paid and to demand what has not been paid. 
if an ally, if an Athenian or an ally does wrong, and then it goes on to describe the, volu the de details of volunteer prosecution um, for anybody who hasn't paid their tribute, the trial at the council and the punishment. So the inscription lays out procedures which appear to prevent the possibility of discrepancies between the amount of tribute alleged by a city to have been paid and the amount actually received by the Athenians. According to this decree, a written record authenticated with special seals was to accompany the tribute brought to Athens. It was to be opened on delivery and was compared to the tribute received. The Helena Tamii, the Athenian officials responsible for tribute collection, translated here as the Greek treasurers, were to report to an assembly at Athens which what the cities had paid and which cities had not paid. Non-payers were to be pursued and legal provisions, uh, legal processes were provided to anyone who abused this system. So the inscription offers us first-hand evidence for Athenian bureaucracy. They like uh, record keeping. It also shows us in great detail the role of the Athenian council and the assembly in that administration, the role of elected officials and the role of volunteer prosecution in ensuring that rules were adhered to. It shows us how the imperialism of the Athenians and their financial organization was very much intertwined with their political culture of democracy and participation. And it leads us to ask questions about what kind of political culture it was that wanted to write this type of thing up on stone in public. So it shows us how democracy and imperialism were intertwined in a sort of procedural sense, not just a financial sense, it wasn't just that um, imperialism was funding democratic payment, but it was also the case that the administration of both was very much intertwined. Let me move on to uh, the second key topic that I identified as relevant to inscriptions, art and architecture. And for this key topic, I've chosen the Erecteion accounts. This inscription, unlike the other two that I'm discussing today, was brought to the UK by the traveller Richard Chandler and the Society of the Dilettanti in their expedition to Athens in 1765 to 1766. The inscription was presented to the British Museum in 1785. It's a slab of white marble, the face of which is very worn, probably worn by um, hands that have touched it uh, over the past uh, 235 years when it's been hung at the British Museum and it's inscribed on two sides. It's currently on display in room G19, that's classical Athens, of the British Museum. It pertains to work on the construction of the temple on the Athenian Acropolis known as the Erecteion, sacred to Erecteus. Work on this temple was started probably after 421 BC, but work was postponed for some unknown reason. But in late summer 409 BC, the Athenian assembly passed a decree proposed by a certain Epigenes appointing a commission to complete the temple. The inscri inscription contains a report of the commission recording its progress during their first year of rebuilding. It contains a survey of the unfinished parts of the temple, an inventory of building materials on the site, and an account of new construction initiated by the commission. And this is a very short excerpt from it. This is what it says. We found the following parts of the temple half finished at the corner towards the Kekropion, the following. Four wall blocks in place, length four feet, width two feet, thickness one and a half one mascaliaia, length four feet, width three feet, thickness one foot and a half, five blocks of wall crown, length four feet, width three feet, thickness one foot and a half. It's a document then that gives us insight into several things. The fact that the Athenians must have left this like a building site for several years. It gives us technical details about their building project and it again says something about the administrative mindedness of the Athenians and their readiness to record things at such a great a high level of detail. 
Let me move on to the third key area that I identified, religion and its significance. And for this, I've chosen a fragment of a fifth century Athenian sacred calendar. It's one of the few pieces of contemporary evidence from this era, dating to about 470 to 450 BC. It was brought, like the Kleinias decree, to the UK among the Elgin marbles. It's a slab of white marble in far inscribed on four sides, which contain an account of sacrifices that are to be made at particular festivals. It's now in store at the British Museum. It says this, the officials shall give to the priest three half cups of something which is then lost, and it goes on to mention firewood. On the sixth of the month, Thargelion, for the heroines of, then the text is lost, a full-grown animal, half as much for the hero, more firewood. At the festival of Plunteria, for Athena, a sheep is to be sacrificed. During the month, Skyrophorion, something else happens, but we don't know what text is lost. For Hermes, two measures, two dry measures of wheat and three spits. For the two heroes in the plain, a full-grown animal for each. The inscription then tells us something about the Athenians' attention to detail with respect to the deities and the heroes they made sacrifices to. It tells us the dates when the sacrifice was were to be undertaken. Um, it tells us um, the types of sacrifices, it tells us that um, sacrifice is probably a rather messy and uh, a bloody uh, affair, which involves burning things with firewood. It probably involves cooking meat on spits, which would be later distributed among the population. So in conclusion then, we often hear about the close reading of literary texts that's something undertaken by our colleagues who study literature. It reflects the close study and attention to a text in a way that's informed by awareness of the significance of its themes and intertextual references. But I close with a suggestion that a close reading of an inscription can offer us a similarly productive way of thinking about ancient history and can allow us close insight into key aspects of the ancient world. Inscriptions tell us not just about institutions and events, but as snapshots of contemporary evidence, they also say something important about the religious and the cultural mentalities of the ancient Athenians. So uh, that's my very short case for the importance of thinking about inscriptions, even those which aren't uh, uh, identified as um, central sources to these specifications. Um, I'm happy to try to answer any questions or listen to any comments um, on the plausibility of using inscriptions um, in uh, the A-level context. Um, thank you very much.